first, um, you tell me your name and what you do. Yeah, my name's Brandon Reed. Uh, I'm a toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, one of my roles here is to manage our state's Eat Safe Fish program, uh, which sets the fish consumption advisories um, and guidelines that we put out for people who eat fish in Michigan. Okay, great, great. So, you know, I had a viewer call in asking about smelt and why the decline. So I was like, all right, I'll, you know, talk to U.S. Fish and Wildlife about that. But then I ran into an article about P PFOs in smelt, which I had no idea about, and the consumption advisory. So I guess um, just kind of start, like, when did this smelt consumption advisory come out and why, I guess? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> our advisory for smelt um, in Lake Superior um, was first released in March of 2021. Um, this was actually based on data that was shared with us from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources um, from smelt that they collected um, over kind of on the Wisconsin side of Lake Superior over by the Apostle Islands. Um, and those smelt um, had elevated levels of PFOS that were detected. Um, Wisconsin issued um, a one meal per month uh, uh, advisory for those smelt from Lake Superior. And when we looked at that data and compared it to our own processes, um, we found the same, you know, the concentrations align with what we would also recommend as, as one serving per month. Um, <clears throat> so we went ahead and issued that back in March of 2021. Um, but knowing that we didn't have any data on PFOS levels and smelt of our own, um, we worked with our partners at the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy or EGLE. Um, and had them go out and co and conduct some sampling of smelt in Lake Superior over the summer. Um, they work with a couple other partners to get um, smelt samples as well. Um, and they ended up getting a um, several different samples of smelt um, from uh, as far west as Union River and 14 Mile Point near Ontonagon, um, as far east um, as Whitefish Bay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, those results from our own testing and our own processes uh, resulted in similar levels to what Wisconsin had found in their smelt over by the Apostle Islands. Um, so still uh, corresponding with that advisory of one serving per month that we issued in 2021. Um, so that um, advisory is still active. Um, we put out a reminder about that um, in January based on um, the fact that we were seeing similar levels in other smelt um, in other Great Lakes in Michigan, as well as some inland lakes. Um, and did include a reminder about the uh, the Lake Superior advisory um, in that press release. Okay, what was that um, that contamination level of smelt and like how does that compare to what's you know humans can take? I mean, I guess you know what's um... yeah yeah. So um, <clears throat> the range that that we saw in the samples that um, that we collected and looked at um, ranged from two point eight to one hundred and twelve parts per billion of PFOS. Um, the samples that we looked at were um, composite samples of about 20 smelt um, where the heads were removed and then the fish were gutted to remove um, um, the organs and, and, and such inside the fish, um, prepared and tested the way that people would eat them um, normally so to, to kind of get the most representative exposure. Um, <clears throat> and when we get that data back from the lab, um, it tells us the concentration of how much uh, PFOS is in, is in that sample. Um, we then compare that to what we call our fish consumption screening values. And these are scientific values that we've um, uh, set based on information about the toxicity of the chemicals. So in this case, PFOS and kind of what different effects PF PFOS can have and at what concentrations um, <clears throat> when it gets into your body. Um, so then once we got those results, we looked at that, we saw, you know, okay, here's the, you know, the average result or, you know, a, a an average result of the uh, PFOS in those smelt compared it to our screening values and it corresponded to uh, one meal per month category. So the, so what we mean by that when we say, you know, our, our recommendation or our advisory is to no more than one meal per month, um, that corresponds to about an eight ounce serving uh, for adults and then for children um, smaller around two to four ounces um, based on um, age and weight, basically. Um, and that means that if you adhere to that advisory, um, limit to no more than one meal per month of those smelt, um, then that will um, significantly reduce your risk of having any of those harmful health effects that PFOS can cause. Um, eating more than that amount does not necessarily mean that you will have a health effect, um, but our research indicates that that could increase your risk. 
of having that effect in the future. Okay. Okay. What are those health risks that, um, you know, are associated with the PFOS and, and eating um, fish or other, you know, things contaminated with those? Yeah. Yeah. So PFOS has um, a variety of different health effects that it's been associated with. Um, <clears throat> the one that we kind of base our guideline off of is um, what we call the critical effect or the most sensitive effect. And that's the one that um, has been associated with the lowest level of exposure. Um, and that effect is um, thyroid hormone levels, um, some some variations in those uh, normal th thyroid hormone levels. Um, but other effects that have been associated with PFOS include um, immune system effects um, and then some developmental effects um, in fetuses and children. Um, <clears throat> but again, the way that we set our guideline based on the most sensitive effect means that if you are following those guidelines, um, that's protective against not just that sensitive effect, but also all those other ex other potential effects that may happen with higher levels of exposure. Okay, okay, good to know. Um, so you talked about, you know, you did sample smelt from different areas from like the Union River all the way to the east end. Um, I was just actually at the Union River last night. They only caught 30 smelts. <laughs> they weren't running it. But sure. um, so are they, is it, contamination just concentrated to specific areas or is it really like lake wide or shoreline wide? Uh, I, I think it's still, I mean, I think it's still, still too early to say definitively, okay. but the evidence that we're seeing so far is that it's pretty widespread. Okay. Um, you know, the levels that, that were measured in Wisconsin over really like the absolute Western edge of, of Lake Superior, um, Apostle Island area, um, those levels were elevated um, I know over uh, at the Union River and 14 Mile Point, uh, Antonagon area, um, levels were elevated over there as well. And then um, we have some samples from the Keweenaw Bay um, that were elevated and then uh, Whitefish Bay as well um, that were elevated. So it, it it certainly seems like this is this is widespread. It, it doesn't seem like there's a, a specific point mm -hmm. um, or specific area where it's concentrated, but um you know, we do, we do only have, you know, seven or so samples now. We're always looking for more to try to get more information on that. But right now it looks like it's pretty lake wide. Okay. And do you, I mean, it's pretty new, um, you said 2021. Um, is there any idea or reason why smelt are showing these contamination levels to a point where, you know, there is a consumption advisory with them? Yeah. I mean, I, we wish we knew the answer to that. Um, cause we get that a lot and smelt have this reputation of being a very clean fish. They're small, um, what we what we thought we knew about fish was that, you know, these chemicals that build up, the larger the fish, the more chemicals they're going to have. And then the smaller fish are going to have lower levels. Um, and that rings true for, you know, mercury, which is the classic fish contaminant um, for PCBs and dioxins, which is another um, contaminant that can build up in fish. But with PFOS, we haven't really seen that trend so far, and it's not really clear why. Um, it, we just have to do we just have to do some more research and um, it's an, it's an ongoing question. So you are continuing then to do the research and to test and. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sampling, um, that we're working with, um, with Eagle to do, um, I'd, you'd have to get an exact number from them, but I think it's around a thousand fillets, um, per year that they're doing testing on now. Um, really, and every one of those is being tested for PFOS now, um, as well as, um, 39 different, um, 39 additional, um, PF, uh, PFAS analytes. So PFOS, just one chemical in the PFAS family, the perfluoroalkyl substance family. Um, and each of, each of the fillets that goes through is tested for 39 different analytes, um, including PFOS. Okay. So we're, we're, we're doing our best to, to try to test and, and figure out more, um, not just from the Great Lakes, but from inland lakes and rivers as well. Okay, great, great. Um, are smelt the only fish with the P PFOS, PFAS um, advisories, or is there other fish that have that advisory as well? Um, so specifically in the Great Lakes, it is actually only smelt so far that have that um, PFOS, uh, <clears throat> where PFOS is the driving contaminant. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to, to specify, there are other fish that have been tested that PFOS has been found in. Um, <clears throat> and I, I did write these down. So um let's see salmon uh trout whitefish and pike um from the great lakes have all been tested um for pfos and while it has been detected in those fish um it's not at the level where it's the chemical of greatest concern 
and what we then base our guideline off of. Um, so other chemicals like mercury, um, PCBs and dioxins are of greater concern and that's what we base our guidelines off of for those. So, so smelt are the only ones in the Great Lakes um, that have this PFOS um, or a, a guideline based on the PFOS levels. Um, <clears throat> but statewide, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really based on, um, what we're finding is, you know, areas where there's a lot of contamination. If there's a specific source that's contributing to a water body, um, <clears throat> then it seems to affect the fish pretty equally. We've had advisories for, um, many different fish based on, uh, PFOS. Um, there are some water bodies where there's so much pollution, so much PFOS, um, that we just issued an entire water body wide. Um, do not eat advisory um, just because of, you know, incredibly high levels that maybe were, were measured in a couple fish and we want to play it safe. Um, that? Uh, one of those examples is the Huron River. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a particular area where there was some historical pollution in 2018. Um, <clears throat> and particularly nearby the source, the levels in those fish still remain pretty high. Uh, we still got that ongoing. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, there's also an, uh, a, a particular area, kind of like the first, uh, the first kind of area that was tested or where, where fish, or, excuse me, fish were tested uh, for PFOS um, was Clark's Marsh, an area near Oscoda, Michigan, um, where, where extremely high levels were, were tested. And there's a water body wide do not eat as well, uh, based on PFOS. But with the Great Lakes and Lake Superior, I mean, there's not like one source of contamination or an area that has been kind of found. No. No, um, and I'm not, I'm not an expert there on like the sources, mm -hmm. so I can't say too much there. But my understanding is that um, it would be multiple different sources, multiple different rivers, um, potentially contributing to the Great Lakes. Okay, okay. Um, I just have a couple minutes here um, of your time, but is there any other questions that I've missed that you know people have you know obviously been doing probably many of these interviews, but um, anything else that you know people have been concerned about regarding the PFOS? Um, you know, I, I can't really think of anything. The only other thing that I would add, um, is that, you know, our, the, the, the purpose of our guidelines is not to discourage people from eating fish completely. It's not to scare people into, you know, swearing off fish entirely. Um, it's just to keep people informed, um, to give them information that they can use, you know, to inform their own risk, um, and make their, make their own decisions about how much fish, which fish to eat. Um, we want to provide information, want to provide alternatives um, for, you know, cleaner or safer options for fish um, and just make sure that people are informed. Um, and if anyone wants to learn more about our program, uh, our advisories, how they're set, um, or even order some of our materials for free, um, they can do so at our website, which is um, www.michigan.gov slash eat safe fish. Great. That was going to be my next question, but she got that one. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today. And um, I hope to have this story done in a couple of weeks and I can email links if you guys are interested in seeing that then when it's complete. Sure. Be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, since I only do have 40 minutes with Zoom, it does limit me as well for <laughs> amount of, of time that I'm allowed with the free version. So um, just kind of jump right in. But of course, first off, if you want to tell me your name and what you do and your title and all that fun stuff. Sure. My name is Summer Streets. I'm a research scientist at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and I've been studying PFAS in the ambient environment since 2008. Okay, great. Um, Since 2008. So when, so I guess let's first just talk about what PFAS and PFOS are, but start with PFAS. What are PFAS? Okay, PFAS is an acronym that stands for PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and they're a class of several thousand compounds that are persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic, and they're used in just a huge array of consumer and industrial items and processes. They're really kind of everywhere. PFOS is a PFAS, a type of PFAS, a single chemical. It's perfluorooctane sulfonate. And it's a compound that um, was produced up through 2002, and then there was some phase out. And so it's not supposed to be produced in the United States anymore, but it still is in some products. And there are other uh, precursor compounds or other PFAS that can degrade to form PFOS. So we still find it out there in the environment. 
what are those um where those ones that are still where is p fos are still found what are those the precursors there's probably a long list oh, okay <laughs> you don't really want me to go through all that <laughs> it'll become uh alphabet soup and then yeah oh, okay okay um so since we're talking about smelt in lake superior um how and when were they detected the pfos pfo as i always say is pfos yeah, or PFOS or PFOS. I've heard all pronunciations, oh. so whatever feels more comfortable to okay. you. All right. So sometimes it's helpful to spell it like to do the acronym PFOS, <laughs> so you can differentiate. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because that kind of sounds similar then. So PFOS were detected in smelt. Um, kind of when and how did that, you know, happen or come about? So our in Minnesota, we only just started looking at smelt specifically in 2000, oh, in 2021. So our smelt data are very recent. And this was on the heels of Wisconsin having analyzed PFAS and smelt, and they found high concentrations. So we actually for a while had a, we still do, we instituted a one meal a month consumption guidance based on Wisconsin's data, not on Minnesota data. And then we um, got some EPA funding to do some work on the Minnesota portion of Lake Superior. And we got smelt in that study. And so really our first smelt data are they're quite new. Okay, okay. So that's based on because you were doing the doing the studies on other fish in Lake Superior? Well, we at we um, when we went to do the study, yes, there's multiple species of fish, and we were particularly interested in getting our own smelt data because of what Wisconsin had found. And so we wanted to make sure, you know, what was the condition of the smelt in Minnesota, and does it look like what we see in Wisconsin? It doesn't actually. Oh, really? Well, how is, how are they different? So uh, the concentrations in all of the smelt that we collected, all up and down the shore of Lake Superior, we had. Um, close to 100 fish, 100 smelt, and uh, the highest concentration we found was about eight parts per billion, and the average is like two. And so that is in the current kind of low end of concentrations of what we see for any fish really anywhere. So I would not anticipate that we will still need the same kind of uh, limitations on fish consumption for smelt, but you should really probably talk to somebody who does the consumption guidance calculations to confirm that. Okay, okay. Um, I guess kind of going into how do they become contaminated? Is uh, the PFOS, is it in the water or where is this contamination coming from? Sure, well, you have to have the POF, PFOS getting into the water and into the environment in the first place, right? And there's a number of ways that can happen. And that can happen through a release, like through wastewater or an air release where you, then you have deposition onto the water and it's building up, or there can be contaminated groundwater, for example, from maybe an industrial site, and then the groundwater enters the lake and up through the sediments. So there's many, many routes of, of uh, many ways PFAS and PFOS can enter the water. But once it's there, any of the fish that interact with a contaminated area will bioaccumulate the PFOS. It's not just smelt. We find PFOS in many species. And, and in certainly um, smelt do not have the highest concentrations of PFOS, not in the Minnesota portion of Lake Superior anyway. Okay, okay, good to know. Um... So are you, I guess, is it like the constant, because I mean, maybe is it worse along the lake shore or compared to like out, you know, further into the lake or? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, that's, you have to make some generalizations. I'd say, yes, that's probably a safe assumption because of course you do have a dilution when you get out into a lake as big as Lake Superior, right? There's a lot of water there. Um, but it doesn't mean that fish out in the middle aren't going to have any PFAS in them either. They, they can, for sure. Where we tend to see the highest concentrations are at sites that are directly contaminated through a current and ongoing release from like an industrial source, for example. So like in the Twin Cities, we've seen um, chrome platers that have a release contaminating lakes up to a mile away. If there's a stormwater connection to that lake from the from the chrome plater, so um, you know we see 
uh, firefighting foam sites that can impact surface waters and that can impact fish. Um, there's a, a multiple routes, like I said, and multiple different types of sources, but usually you see those really high concentrations are associated with some kind of source, a local source that the fish are uh, interacting with. Okay, okay, that does make sense. Um, so you said that, okay, so people, PFOS have been detected in other fish in the Great Lakes region. I mean, pretty much all species, you know, or is it... Yeah, I mean, it's a huge range, everything from little minnows and creek chub and white sucker up through, you know, northern pike and the biggest um, predator species, right? And PFAS is interesting and different relative to other bioaccumulative contaminants in that it doesn't really biomagnify in fish. So typically with like PCBs, for example, you would see higher and higher concentrations as you go through the different trophic levels in fish. So you would expect like a minnow to not have very much, but maybe a big lake trout would have a lot, mm -hmm. right? Because there's levels there. You don't really see that with PFAS. If the fish is mingling with that source, it's going to be high. So some of the highest concentrations I've ever seen in fish were in a minnow for PFAS. They were in a minnow in a very, very contaminated water that was down in the Twin Cities. Um, or a carp that was collected from a very contaminated spot in the Mississippi River. Those were some of the highest concentrations I've ever seen. But there's not a clear, a clear buildup from the low end of the food web to the high end of the food web with, with PFAS. It can really be any species that are interacting with that source would be contaminated to a high level potentially. Okay. Okay. Um talking about the the smelt again i mean so it's it's the water so i, so I, was, I was wondering you know because smelt are prey fish you know if a lake trout or another you know a larger predator fish eats that um is that going to increase their chances of being contaminated with pfas or is it just pretty much just water contamination again no there can definitely be transferred through the food web absolutely but fish have a special trick that other animals don't have and that they seem to be able to get rid of or depurate their PFAS loads relatively quickly once they're removed to clean water, oh. which I think is really hopeful because then it, when you cut off the source, the fish will start to, the concentration of PFAS in the fish will start to decline relatively rapidly so that within a few years, you can really have a better picture in terms of fish health and human consumption of fish, right? Because the PFAS will then come down. So there is some hope there, unlike PCBs or mercury, where once the fish has that contaminant, it belongs to the fish for life and it will continue to increase throughout its lifespan. So we just, we don't see that same type of pattern with um, PFAS. And I imagine that's why we see a big difference between like the Wisconsin fish and the Minnesota fish, even though these fish can be migratory, it's my guess, I don't know for sure, but based on like the data I've worked with over many years now, it's my guess that those Wisconsin fish were interacting with some local source that we don't have here in Minnesota, that our Minnesota smelt we're not interacting with. And so perhaps if those fish actually migrated from Wisconsin to Minnesota, they had time to depurate their PFAS before they were caught. I mean, it's just a hypothesis, but I've seen this on a number of lakes that I've worked on where the fish start up really high, you address the source, and now a few years later, the fish are in much better condition. Okay, so that's that's positive. <laughs> yes, yes, there is some there is something positive here. <laughs> we'll take it. Because um, you know, so my my next question was going to be: Is there any hope for the future? Because as these are these are forever chemicals, as they're kind of listed as, um, is this like said a forever thing that these fish are going to be contaminated, or is there hope? I think there is some hope, but it really depends on um a few things. Um. You know, if we can stop production of PFAS, I think that will be tremendously helpful. If we can work on managing our current sources so that we're preventing release into the air and land and water in the first place, that will go a long way to protecting our fishing resources. So it, it's, uh, it's hopeful, but there's an asterisk there. We have to actually take some actions in order to make those um, good outcomes a reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definitely um 
what are these good actions that we need to be taking? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it's sort of managing and preventing some of our point sources to make sure that um, there's not a release into the environment. Um, it's helping industry find alternatives that are um, not harmful to the environment that they can use to replace the PFAS. And there's probably some other actions there as well, maybe some, a PFAS ban at some point. Um, it, there are some states that have begun working on PFAS bans uh, of, for non-essential uses. And I think that's good as long as the replacement is not something that's you know equally harmful. Um, so that, that always takes a little bit of work, but mm -hmm. um, definitely there are some opportunities there for uh, improving and preventing the release of PFAS into the environment. Okay. Good, good, good. And it does sound like steps are being taken. So that's smart. Yeah, I think on both the state and federal level, and a lot of states have become really active, including Minnesota. And I know Michigan, where you're at, has been very active in trying to address PFAS issues. So we just need to keep that keep that momentum going and you know keep looking for those sources that we can try and and manage as best we can so i had just recently found out about this i mean your studies back 2021 it's only 2023 so it's only been a couple of years but i really haven't heard much media attention or news about it um does this need to be you know people need to be more aware of this or needs to the message needs to get out there more are you, you're asking specifically about the Lake Superior data that yeah. we have? Yeah. yeah, they have not been fully released yet. We only just started getting data in kind of late 2022. And right now um, I'm working on writing it up and getting that into a report that goes to EPA by June 30th of this year. And then we'll be publishing shortly thereafter. So um, I think there'll, there will be some more you know, public uh, sharing of the data more broadly, but we're really just wrapping that study. It can take a long time from like, you know, collecting 500 fish and then getting them to the lab and getting them all analyzed and then QAing all the data and getting it all written up. It's quite a process to get that done. So, okay. So you sounds have old. It sounds like, oh, they're two years old already. It should be, you know, already moving along, but it, it takes a while from okay. the start of the project to the finish to get things out there. Okay. So that's why I haven't heard much about yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's, coming. it's coming. <laughs> What's that? It's coming. It's coming. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, everything, you know, especially when you're working with wildlife and fish. And <laughs> yeah, it, takes, some it takes some time. And, you know, a big project like that, the Lake Superior Basin geographically is rather large. And so we had a number of different partners helping us collect fish. And then it's, you know, orchestrating, getting them to the lab. And then they have, you know, hundreds of fish to work on. And it can take quite a while to, to get through all that. Who all worked on this report then in this study? Well, the report's in progress, so that's me, um, some colleagues at EPA in Duluth, and also a colleague at DNR Fisheries in Duluth, Minnesota as well, um, and that's as far as writing the report goes, and then we've got um, lots of other folks who were involved in collections, including other DNR folks, um, MPCA, some of the tribes in the Lake Superior Basin. I need a drink of water. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully you can edit that out. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Editing is <coughs> like I'm having a tremendous itch all of a sudden. It's all right. Sorry about yeah, that. For. No, that's what I like I'm crying. Why are you asking me one question about PFAS? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Cool. Okay. I think I'm better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I think that's I got right. it. <laughs> So yeah, if we can talk a little bit more about that study then. So it started in 2021. Why did this study even begin with or start in the beginning? I mean, what brought it all? Sure. We've done a lot of fish work in Minnesota for many years. We, I think our first fish that we collected might've been back in like 2002. <clears throat> We've been doing fish statewide for a long time. And there's um, always been more interest in getting more Lake Superior Basin fish. There were quite a lot of untested waters there. You know, a lot of our work, even some of our statewide work had been more focused around urban areas. Um, so getting some of these more remote waters was really important. And then of course, Wisconsin had the, the surprise of finding high concentrations in smelt. And then we wanted to know what do our smelt look like? So it's a, it's a great opportunity to 
go to some waters that haven't been tested before that are important for harvest and at the same time collect some smelt and get a whole picture of what's happening in the basin relative to PFAS. Those kind of big surveys can be really helpful too, because you can, um, you know, you can find the waters that are cleaner that you can direct folks to. If there's a source, maybe you'll stumble upon it, and then you can work on that as well. So, those are really um, helpful. Large when you to do a large survey like that, where you get a lot of different waters in a big area. Um. Yes. We talked about how to minimize, but um, is there anything else that you feel like people should really understand about why you're surveying the fish, why you want to know what the levels are, um, what PFAS is doing to them? Yeah, specifically about fish. I mean, they're sort of a canary in the coal mine in a way, right? They're um, an excellent indicator of, of when we do have a source that is causing a release that is impacting the wildlife and the resource. Sadly, I mean, they're kind of what tells us like, oh, there's something going on here. Let's go figure it out so we can address that. So that that is one thing is that we, we use these as a sort of um, gauge, <laughs> if you will, of environmental health and, and as a, a way to alert us to issues that might be present so we can get on top of them. Um, also, of course, there's human health issues. And we touched on that really briefly. And I don't want to go deep on that. But um, you know, people love to eat fish and people have a right to be able to go out and fish and eat any of the fish that they catch. But some of those fish maybe aren't the greatest to eat. And so that we want to be able to tell people like, maybe find a, a cleaner water, mm -hmm. you know, and so you have to test a lot of fish to find the cleaner waters to send them to also, right? So it's kind of a combination of um, finding sources, understanding the health of the uh, resource, cluing people into where they can safely fish, um, helping us guide our other sort of regulatory efforts to work towards sources. And then there's the ecological uh, side itself. Like, are the fish highly impacted? How does that affect the rest of the food chain? There are things that eat fish that um, could be highly impacted. And it's helpful to know those things as well. So we make sure that we're keeping our resource safe and protected. Okay. Right, because there's fish. I mean, obviously, a lot of birds, you know, eat fish. A lot of other other mammals. Eat sure, fish. a lot of mammals, mink, and that sort of thing. Yes, there's absolutely a lot of uh, different critters that eat fish, and I think there's there's starting to be some more attention on ecological health and not just human health, which is wonderful. Um, EPA has some draft aquatic life criteria that they've released, and so those have been through comment, and I imagine those will be final before too long, and I think that's wonderful. Um, thinking not not just about human health, but about ecological health as well. Okay. And what is the name of the survey that you you know you've completed and near the report that's coming out? It's not very flashy. PFAS in the Minnesota, wait, maybe PFAS and fish in the Minnesota portion of the Lake Superior Basin. Okay. So very I know straightforward. It's a <laughs> <laughs> not very flashy. No. But it'll tell you what it's about. There you go. Okay. Any um any other results that you can share from that that you found surprising um, or anything surprising? Yeah. You know, we we had a few sources, a couple that we were aware of. We had a new one and we're working on that now. Um we had 15 waters that had absolutely no detectable PFAS, which was surprising to me because in all of the fish work I've done, I've never had a single water come back without at least one fish that has some PFAS in it. So that seemed like a big deal to find some spots where there is none. And I think that is also a hopeful piece that yes, these contaminants are ubiquitous, but if there's not a local source, like you can still find clean waters. That's great. <laughs> let's keep it that way, right? And let's not, let's not go crazy and make sure they're all contaminated. Let's keep the ones that are clean, clean. And it's nice to have those waters that you can send people to. You know, if you just tell them don't eat here, you have to say, but you can eat there. Yeah. Right. Right. So people don't like to told, be told not to do something to begin with. So well, and if you don't give them an alternative, it feels very hopeless mm -hmm. and very gloom and doom. And it's like, well, I'm going to get fish anyway. And like, I'm just going to go to the contaminated one because I don't know where else to go. Right. So it's great to have, it's great to have some in your pocket that you can say, Hey, there's some good ones, <laughs> you know? Good, good.
Do you know if um, Michigan is doing any of the same um, surveys, reports that you're doing? Well, I don't know. I wouldn't say they're identical, but I think both Wisconsin and Michigan are doing plenty of fish work. So, um, and they, I believe Michigan was working on PFAS and smelt also be based on Wisconsin's findings. So um, there should be some data forthcoming, but more than that, I can't tell you. I don't know. Okay. All right. That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll do some digging and see what I can, what I can find. Um, I said as when I did just start, you know, jumping online, looking for stuff, your name is the one that came up. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've been doing the fish for a really long time, really. And they're, I mean, I really love these fish. So what got you into, you know, working in this, this arena and chemical contaminants on the, and all that? Yeah. When I was in undergrad, I took a class called chemical fate and transport, which is actually kind of an unusual class for an undergraduate level. <laughs> And um, that's when I was really first thinking about bioaccumulation and buildup of contaminants in the food web. And it just made me really kind of angry, <laughs> made me angry and upset, like a, like a righteous anger. And I wanted to learn more and do something about it. And, um, you know, luckily at the time when I was looking at graduate school, we had one of the foremost scientists in the field and doing bioaccumulation research at the U of M. Uh, Dr. Deb Swackhammer, who sadly uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but I had the great good fortune and honor uh, to work with her as a graduate student and study um, bioaccumulation of contaminants in Lake Superior in Michigan. So that was my my graduate work. I've been doing this now for, for quite a long time. It was did, did not start as PFAS, um, but PFAS soon took over and now really is the only thing I am ever have time to think about anymore. It's all PFAS all the time. <laughs> that could be depressing I guess I don't know <laughs> some days <laughs> some days it is I will not lie <laughs> yes so what have you seen since you've started in the PFAS have you seen improvements have you seen any changes it, in improvements in the sense that there's a lot more awareness now amongst the different agencies and there's a lot of energy behind tackling the issue and for a long time, it was just pretty quiet. And it was just sort of me and a couple other folks at the agency sort of working over here on the side. But now it's a big deal. It's become a huge, huge part of the agency's work. And all the programs are involved at this point, which is great. That's a huge change and improvement from even just five years ago <laughs> working on this. So that's awesome. That, and then there's a lot more public awareness. I see a lot of articles being written about PFAS and that's great because they can be a sort of mind boggling um, buzzkill <laughs> type of topic, right? That's very complicated and it doesn't sound like there's a lot of good news usually. And um, those are things people don't often like to hear about, but I, I think there's been a number of wonderful write-ups on the topic and there's more public awareness. And I think that's a huge improvement too and a big change. Great, great. Um, specifically Lake Superior. I mean, it's our largest freshwater lake. It's something that all, you know, our states are proud of here in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Um, but if you want to just like touch base on, you know, the importance of testing these waters and testing the fish and making sure it's all healthy and what we can do to keep it that way. Yeah, I mean, I think the importance of testing comes down to like, if you don't, if you don't look, you won't know. And just because you don't know doesn't mean it's all good, right? And if you, if you don't know, then you can't fix the problem. So it's, it starts with doing some basic testing to see what's out there and make sure that the resource is healthy. And if it's not, then you have to figure out why not. And once you figure that out, you can start to take the steps to make it better. But you, it, it all starts with the testing. You can't really make any uh, headway if, if you don't know what you're going after in the first place. That's what people be like, well, don't test it. Then we won't know. And then we're all just clueless and running around. And <laughs> oh, and I think that is, is wrong. <laughs> I just feel that is wrong in my bones. I mean, just because you don't know that um, something bad is happening doesn't mean it's not happening. It's still happening, mm -hmm. you know, and we want to protect people. We want to protect the resource. We want it to be safe for everyone to enjoy. 
for years to come, generations to come. And it should be because we all have a right to that public resource. It's a beautiful, tremendous resource that we have. I mean, really like Superior is just um, probably my favorite place on earth, honestly. And, um, you know, if we, if we don't remain aware of our own impacts onto that resource, it becomes very easy then to just sort of keep shunting our wastes there or, you know, let things become worse until they get to a point where you can't fix it. So I think really um, making sure it's our responsibility uh, to make sure that we keep an eye on the resource and look out for it and do what we can to make it better.